Anatomy of the Bone In humans, the skeletal system is made up of bones. The femur or thigh bone is a long bone having a shaft known as diaphysis and the two extremities are called epiphysis. The epiphysis regions are covered by a hyaline cartilage. The outer covering of the bone is known as the periosteum. Bone consists of numerous blood vessels. In the diaphysis region next to the periosteum is the layer of compact bone. Next to it is the spongy bone. It consists of a network of thin interconnected bony structures called trabeculae. The spaces between these are filled with soft marrow tissue. A look inside the spongy bone shows some bone cells like the osteoclasts which can observe worn out bone tissue. Another type of cells seen is the osteoblast which synthesize new bone matrix. We can also observe some stem cells which can divide and redivide to form numerous stem cells. These cells then lose their nucleus and get transformed into red blood corpuscles. One of the major functions of the bone marrow is to produce RBCs. A magnified view of the compact bone shows that it is composed of many parallel and longitudinally arranged columns called haversian system or osteon. The area between haversian systems is occupied by interstitial lamellae. Each haversian system consists of several concentric layers of plates of bones known as lamellae. In between the lamellae, we observe flat irregular spaces known as lacunae. Tissue fluid is present in them along with osteoblast. Lacunae are connected to each other by fine channels called the canaluculi. The longitudinal central canal is known as Haversian canal. It contains the nerves, blood vessels and the lymph vessels. Epithelial tissue The epithelial tissue can be divided into simple epithelium and compound epithelium. Simple epithelium can again be divided into squamous, cuboidal, columnar and ciliated. Squamous epithelium Squamous epithelium forms the inner lining of the blood vessels. The cells are thin, flattened and contain little cytoplasm enclosing a centrally placed disc-shaped nuclei. The margins of the cells are irregular that fit closely into those of the neighboring cells. It helps in diffusion of materials across the membrane. Another type of epithelial tissue is the cuboidal epithelium. It is found in the pancreas. In a cross section, we can see the pancreatic ducts closely and find that they are made up of cuboidal cells which possess a central spherical nucleus. At the surface, the cells have a polygonal outline but appear cuboidal in vertical section. They help in secretion of enzymes. The third type of epithelial tissue is known as columnar epithelium. It is found lining the intestine. These cells are tall and quite narrow. The nucleus is located at the base. The main function is absorption of nutrients. Another type of columnar epithelial modification is glandular epithelium. It is found in the gastric pits in which the cells have become specialized for secretion of chemical substances. They secrete the gastric juice. The next type of epithelial tissue is the ciliated epithelium. 
it forms the lining of the respiratory passage. These cells are columnar or cuboidal but bear numerous cilia at the free surface. The function of the ciliated epithelium is to move particles in a specific direction. The compound epithelial tissue can be divided into stratified epithelium and transitional epithelium. Stratified epithelium can be studied through the example of skin. It is called compound tissue because it has many superficial layers like the stratum corneum, stratum lucidum, stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum. The living cells with dense protoplasm are found in the stratum basale. Stratum corneum has heavy deposition of keratin, which makes it impervious to water. Another type of compound epithelium is that of the transitional epithelium. This is found in the inner lining of the urinary bladder. The epithelial layer is much thin, stretchable, and is made up of cuboidal cells. A closer look at the cells show that they are cuboidal. When the bladder is empty but can stretch and flatten considerably as the bladder accumulates urine. Thus, the urinary bladder is elastic and flexible. Number and size of cells To learn about the number of cells, let us study the human digestive system. A magnified view of the stomach shows the presence of various types of cells which together perform the process of digestion of food. Along with the food particles, we also observe some bacteria which have entered our body. Each bacterium is a single cell structure but has the capacity to perform all the life processes. It feeds on the food particles and uses this energy to grow. It reproduces by dividing into two by the process of binary fission. This single-celled bacterium is a unicellular organism. But in multicellular organism like man, the stomach shows epithelial cells which are closely packed together to prevent the bacteria from entering further into the body. Some specialized oxyntic cells are seen which release hydrochloric acid. This acid helps to kill the bacteria. Another type of specialized cells seen in the stomach are the zymogenic cells. These are responsible for releasing the enzyme pepsinogen. Pepsinogen is then activated by HCL and it facilitates digestion of food. In a multicellular organism, numerous cells help in performing one function. As we move into an aquatic environment, we can observe numerous small algal cells. A small cell shows a very high metabolic rate and so it grows in size and the metabolic rate is slowed down. So with maturity the cell grows but after it attains the maximum size the cell divides into two by binary fission. So the metabolic rate is restored to normal again. So. Now we can clearly understand why the size of the cell is a deciding factor as to when the cell division occurs. In the human skeletal system, a magnified view of the spongy bone shows numerous stem cells. They are small in size and have the capacity to divide rapidly. Some of these stem cells enter the arteries 
and differentiate into various blood corpuscles like the RBCs. Now, they lose their capacity to divide and can pick up oxygen efficiently and transport it to the cells. Impulse Transmission One of the most vital organs of the human body is the brain. A look inside the brain shows a fascinating network of neurons where the impulse travels in the form of action potential. To understand the process of transmission, let us focus on a neuron. We can clearly observe that the impulse travels along the neuron in one direction. It moves always from the cyton to the axon. But a closer look at the junction between the neurons shows that there is a gap known as synaptic cleft. The synaptic region shows the presence of a synaptic knob on the presynaptic neuron and a concavity on the postsynaptic neuron. When we observe synaptic knob, we see the mitochondria and vesicles. These vesicles contain a chemical transmitter known as acetylcholine or ACH. As the impulse reaches the synaptic knob, a chemical substance called acetylcholine is released. This is a chemical transmitter and on reaching the postsynaptic neuron, it binds to the receptor and activates the postsynaptic neuron. This excitatory response involves the opening of the sodium gates, which triggers a wave of depolarization. This depolarization wave travels through this neuron. Once the neuron is activated, the acetylcholine is released from the receptors and it reaches the synaptic cleft. Simultaneously, the sodium gates are closed. An enzyme known as acetylcholine esterase, present in this region, binds to the ACH molecule and breaks it up into acetate molecule and choline molecule. The acetate molecule moves out of the cleft region while the choline molecule is absorbed back into the synaptic knob for later use. 